Hi everyone, my name is Alex Fitzpatrick. I am a almost finished PhD student at the University of Bradford. I'm also a zooarchaeologist and I'm very happy to be here to talk to you a bit about some of my PhD research and a little bit more about zooarchaeology in general. So let me share my screen. So yeah, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my PhD research at the Cowsey Caves, but it'll be a bit of a case study in explaining and discussing ritual and funerary zooarchaeology to begin with. So kind of the goal of this talk is to expand your conception of zooarchaeology, not only for the archaeologists who are watching this right now, because I know not everyone's a zooarchaeologist. I'm sure many of you already have heard of the term or even do it. But I feel like it's a little, you know, uh, underappreciated in um, our discipline. So I try to do my best to wrap it um, as best as I can. And of course, for any non-archaeologists who are watching this right now, um, you may not know not know what zooarchaeology is, so this will be a great, um, hopefully a great uh, introduction to it. And as I said, this will draw on my just completed PhD research as a bit of an example, and just a quick um, heads up that there is one image of a, a human remain in this presentation, so if you don't really want to see any of that, feel free to skip, I won't be mad, um, just ethically. I want to make sure that that's known before we get started. So this is a bit of a refresher for any archaeologists out there, but I figured might as well start off with this, you know, what is zooarchaeology? And the most broad definition I can think of is that it is the study of animals in the archaeological record. It's basically what it boils down to. And originally it was basically conceived of as uh, what are considered laundry lists at the end of uh, archaeological reports in uh, appendices, but it eventually developed into its own kind of subfield. So early zooarchaeology was unsurprisingly considered uh, or concerned with how animals were being used on archaeological sites. It's very focused on subsistence and domestication, which, when you think about it, does make sense um, for, I think, for many of us who are meat eaters. And when you think about animals, you might tend to think of the ones that we eat. <laughs> no offense, of course. <laughs> so, as we tend to think of animal remains as food remains, you know, we tend to also think of them as rubbish, as part of middens where waste is being collected. And of course, that's kind of what a lot of the early zooarchaeology was. If you're excavating, you know, domestic sites and you have lots of animal remains and signs of butchery, you know, then you're probably looking at farms and places where people are eating and possible feasting sites. Um, so it makes sense why, you know, early zoo archaeologists were very concerned with that. And a lot of your, the early zoo archaeology that you see is looking at that, looking at it from that perspective. And of course, this isn't to discount their importance. <laughs> you know, just because it's, you know, mostly looking at animals as food or as domesticated species doesn't mean that it's only telling us about those types of things, you know. It can tell us loads of things, um, cultural attitudes to specific foods, such as taboos or, you know, status. Obviously, in the past, some pieces of meat were considered higher status than other uh, pieces and species of meat. Technological advances, of course, as well. But obviously, animal remains are much more representative of other things. So these are two of the most extreme versions, I think, of the idea of zooarchaeology as food. We have coffee bean snail remains from a Caribbean feasting pit from the uh, Florida Museum. And then you have butchered 
cattle scapula from Roman hay ridge in the UK. Two completely different things right there, snails and cattle. So zooarchaeology is inherently anthropocentric, which again, makes sense. Archaeology is concerned of, about human history. But we do so much more with animals besides eating them. Animals are a huge part of our lives. We both live with them and alongside them. So not only as companions, as pets sometimes, as domesticated species, but also all the animals that live around us in our environment. Um, and, you know, we use them to both think and eat and they have a huge importance in our culture. So zooarchaeology helps us kind of reconstruct these relations in the past between us and animals. And this can be direct uh, relations. So again, hunting, raising on farms, domesticating, living alongside as companions, or more indirectly. So again, those animals that live around us and maybe closer than we, we'd like to think if you're thinking of rodents or animals like that. Um, and this also includes more symbolic and abstract relations. And that's where we get to ritual and funerary zooarchaeology. And these are two images that I'm a little biased about because they are images that were used in one of my episodes of Eons, which is a great YouTube series. And, but they're just really fantastic works of art that I think really hit home the idea, like the romanticized idea of zooarchaeology that I always uh, have about reconstructing these past relations. So um, on the right, you have a reconstruction of a 9,500 year old burial from Cyprus that was somewhat recently uh, excavated, and it's of a cat and a human, and that's by Julio Lacerda. And then on the left, you have uh, kind of a reconstruction of a prehistoric dog burial from David Howe, who is also doing incredible work on looking at the uh, kind of archaeology and history of relations between animals and humans, specifically dogs and humans. So definitely check that out. So ritual and funerary zooarchaeology. Given the use of animal offerings and burials in many archaeological contexts, having this zooarchaeological perspective makes sense. Animals can be buried alongside human remains as companions or pets, as offerings or sacrifices, as part of feasting. There's many different kind of relations you can have in this context, which is extremely fascinating to me. Ultimately, you do get a lot of overlap with other activities, which is why context becomes extremely key. Hence, the kind of creation in zooarchaeological theory of special deposits, and this eventually becomes you know, refined into a concept known as ABGs, also known as associated bone groups. And this is something that James Morris, who is a fantastic zooarchaeologist and one of my heroes, has developed. And so it really focuses on the importance of who or what is found alongside these remains, as well as, you know, how much of the animal is found. Is it the whole animal? Is it just the head? Is it just, you know, the meat bearing? parts of the animal. And again, it's the context that's really, really important. And here are three of probably my um, favorite examples of ritual and funerary zooarchaeology. So on the top left, you have an Iron Age horse and chariot burial from Yorkshire, which is where I live currently. And those are always fantastic when they get found. On your right, you have a pet baboon burial from here at Campolis uh, in Egypt, one of those exotic animals that have been found in Egyptian contexts, which is, again, really interesting to think of in terms of, you know, pet trade and status of animals. Um, and at the bottom left, you have the Mesolithic headdress made of deer from Star Car in the UK. And we will touch a little bit on that uh, later. So we will now get to my PhD research. Um, 
So the Caldi Caves, um, they are located um, in the northeast of Scotland, in uh, near the Mer the Maury Firth. Apologies for mispronunciation. <laughs> and um, my research was focused on the taphonomy of animal and human remains from these caves, and it represented some of the first uh, focused zooarchaeological analysis of these remains, which is, you know. <laughs> bit of a, a huge uh, burden to have on your shoulders, but hopefully I did a good job. And um, I just want to note that some of the analyses were impacted by COVID. Um, one of the lucky people who was basically finishing their PhD when the pandemic first started. So um, if uh, you have any questions, uh, I think they will be, current ar archaeology will be messaging us with questions after the talks are posted on YouTube. So um, if you have any questions, uh, just bear that in mind. Um, there were a couple things that I really wanted to do that unfortunately I could not do because of the pandemic and the lack of uh, laboratory access. So just kind of introduce you to the caves. Um, we focused on four caves, which basically made up this potential larger mortuary complex. Um, so we have the Sculptor's Cave, which is arguably the most famous of these caves. Um, my supervisors, Dr. Lindsay Booster and uh, Professor Ian Armit, both from the University of York, have a monograph out on their work on the Sculptor's Cave. So um, this is my plug for their work. It is great. Um, and I'm not saying that as a PhD student, but it is a very fascinating site. Um, highly recommend it. And it was mainly used for comparative purposes as obviously the monograph was out and most of the research has already been done on there. Um, and it represents several decades of excavation. So you have the first excavations in 1931 with Sylvia Benton. And then in the 1970s, Ian and Alexandra Shepard excavated. And then uh, between 2015 and 2018, uh, Lindsay, Booster and Ian Armit were excavating there. So lots of different uh, sources of information, um, lots of archival stuff, very fascinating site. Uh, it's most famous for Pictish symbols, which were carved into the wall, and also uh, numerous juvenile human remains, including some juvenile mandibles that were placed at the entrances, hinting at perhaps um, full juvenile heads being placed at these entrances, which uh, apparently caused a bit of a stir with uh, <laughs> gossip magazines when uh, um, this information was uh, came out as part of the research, uh, which I can understand. It's very flashy, but again, extremely interesting in terms of looking at it from a, a ritual and funerary perspective. So the zooarchaeological analysis was done by Claire Rainsford and Dale Sargentson. Uh, I believe they mostly looked at the archival work and also did some zooarchaeological analysis as well on the animal bones there. Uh, so Caldi Cave 2, which is the one on the bottom left, that is the main focus of my research. It was also known as the Deer Cave. And back in 2015, there was a back chamber that was discovered uh, and after I identified a couple of canid remains, uh, it was named the wolf chamber. Uh, we aren't entirely sure if there are wolves that were in that cave, but, you know, it would be nice. Uh, <laughs> I'll get back to that in a little bit. And it was excavated in the 1960s by G.L. Darge, who was an amateur archaeologist. And then we had the 2015-2018 excavations done by Booster and Armit. And then in Kazi Cave 1, which is the top right photo, was also excavated in the 1960s by Jail Darge, and then again in 2018 by Armin and Booster. And it's known for the Shakespeare Passage, which is a passage that has Shakespeare-related graffiti etched into the walls. And then the final cave is Laird Stables, which is the bottom right photo. And it was allegedly used as a stable for horses of Sir Robert Gordon of Gordonston in 1745, but not 100% sure if that's true. Uh, again, we will get into that uh, in a bit. So the methodology I used for this research was very complex uh, looking back on it. Um, 
so obviously I use a lot of nut, what would be part of, I guess, the nuts and bolts um, zooarchaeological analysis, uh, species and element IDs, things like that. And one of the main focuses, however, was on the taphonomy. Uh, so just to clarify, in case you don't know, taphonomy is a bit of a catch-all word. Um, it's something I realized as I did the research on this. Um, people tend to use taphonomy to mean lots of things. And I think the kind of best definition was probably by Lyman and just kind of paraphrasing a bit. Um, it basically refers to all the processes that create the physical and chemical characteristics of the archaeological assemblage. Um, realistically, that means it starts off from how the site was created. So, you know, the, the species that were existing in that environment and you know the kind of like characteristics of the environment that influence the kind of species that exist there all the way to curation so kind of the way we clean these bones and store them affects the kind of physical and chemical characteristics of the remains so very broad <laughs> when you think about it in that those kind of terms um, but also very important. Um, you need to understand the taphonomic processes at hand in order to differ differentiate between the natural or natural versus the anthropogenic modifications and thus interpret the activities occurring with these remains. So ultimately it requires focus analyses of several factors. So fragmentation, butchery, burning, gnawing, weathering, all those things. Uh, this chart basically <laughs> uh, sums up a lot of what I end up doing during my PhD. Um, again, it's, it's a very broad kind of subset of archeology span in terms of looking at all of these kind of elements. But again, by looking at all these elements, you can kind of understand and reconstruct the things that happen to these remains. Uh, and of course, lots of things could happen to these remains. So it makes sense why it becomes a very complex kind of study. Um, and then this leads to the next major part of my methodology, which was the comparative analysis. So we used comparative analysis to kind of highlight the characteristics of interest in ritual and funerary assemblages. Um, I don't wanna say non-normative because that's very assumptive, but that's kind of what I mean by that. Um, you know, what would we see in say a domestic site versus what we see at the Cowsey Caves, which are certainly not domestic sites. Um, so this was, a, this happens in two parts basically. So you have the caves comparing against themselves because we want to understand what kind of activities were happening in each specific cave and, you know, how did they connect to one another if they even connected to one another, you know. And then we also compared the human remains with the animal remains. We wanted to kind of see, you know, the differences and similarities in treatment of the dead and kind of help us understand these really complex later prehistoric funerary rites. Um, so the picture on the left is one of the um, vertebra from a human remain from Cowsey Cave 2. Oh, sorry, no, Sculptor's Cave. <laughs> and um, it's uh, it's got a representation of decapitation. So we know that that's some kind of element that's happening in those caves to the human remains, but what was actually happening to the animal remains. Uh, and then the other thing that we were comparing to is, again, like I was saying before, the domestic sites kind of picking up those elements that are very unique and related more to the ritual and funerary aspects. So what we did was we took the certain context from Brockham of Hillport, which is a contemporary site, also in Scotland. Um, Iron Age site has the largest assemblage of faunal remains in Scotland. So loads of, uh, uh, things there to compare with. So it was a sort of control group, basically, of domestic faunal remains to provide a baseline for this analysis. 
So kind of just going through the, the fines themselves. I won't get too into it because um, I don't necessarily want this to be all about my PhD research, uh, though it is mostly about my PhD research. Um, and I'm sure this will hopefully be published at some point. Uh, so Cassie Cave 2, we have, um, let me go to the next slide, many felid and canid bones. And this is something that we found in all the caves for the most part, felid and canid bones. And unfortunately, we did send them out for a DNA analysis, so ancient DNA, uh, to get looked at. Um, but unfortunately, it, nothing really, it, there wasn't enough organic material, I believe, to get a good uh, result. So unfortunately, I will be referring to them as felid and canid remains. And the reason why is because we were very torn on were they cats and dogs or were they wolves and wildcats? And that may sound very arbitrary, but it's a huge difference in interpretation because on one hand you have domesticated animals, uh, which br brings it a sense of these are companion animals or at least, you know, related to the human inhabitants that are using these caves. And on the other hand, you have wild species, wolves and wildcats. And that, again, has a different connotation. Are they more inhabitants of these caves that have nothing really to do with the human activity? Um, so that's one of the major downsides to this research, because obviously that would have brought so much more complexity to the uh, resulting interpretation. But, you know, kind of the story of archaeology, you, you won't win them all. Uh, so yeah, in the, the Kowsi Cave 2 is a very fascinating cave. It has many different periods of activities. So just kind of going through them very quickly. The Neolithic period, we have many large red deer remains, including a cranial vault, which is the one you can see on the top left, um, which is very similar to the star car headdress that I showed you in a previous slide. Uh, unfortunately, this cranial vault didn't have any of the signature butchery marks that were found on the star car uh, headdresses. But again, there's still, you know, that possibility still remains. And it's just so well preserved and amazing. It's one of the my favorite finds from this research. Um, so yeah, we have these large red deer remains. Um, on the top right, you have a red deer um, mandible. So the one from the cave is on the bottom and it's compared with a modern red deer mandible just to give you a sense of the, the size difference and just how huge <laughs> these animals were that we were finding in these these itty bitty cave spaces. Um, and we also have great auk, uh, which is an extinct bird appearing in these Neolithic and Bronze Age uh, contexts. And it's found throughout, uh, which again, a very interesting find that I don't think any of us really expected <laughs> in this. So then you move on to the late Bronze Age, which is the main period of human activity, which is based on human remains, uh, the increase in butchery, and other anthropogenic modifications that uh, were noticed. Humans were being excarnated, which means their remains were being brought into the caves and basically left to deflesh uh, naturally. And although there are some instances of butchery implying that maybe there was a bit of manual excarnation, so manual defleshing to help the process along. And they were protected from the non-human inhabitants of the caves by using raised platforms. Animal remains, on the other hand, were deposited onto the cave floor and not protected. Thus, they were scavenged and gnawed upon, which is how I found them. And most interesting about this cave, um, so originally, I. We went into this research thinking this is going to be about the later prehistoric. Turns out <laughs> there was lots of bones that were dated to the medieval and post-medieval period, which is way, way after <laughs> the <laughs> the prehistoric. So this was a huge surprise. And again, it just brings another really interesting layer to this research. Um, so again, we have many field remains found here, as well as a 
really diverse representation of avian remains, including uh, a crane, crane bones, including this tibiotarsis, the leg bone, which is here on the bottom left, and a domestic fowl, including a rooster, which you can see on the bottom left here, sorry, crane bone on the bottom right, uh, rooster bone on the bottom left with the cockspur, and it also had geese, cor corvids, uh, great Auk. It was so fascinating, this uh, assemblage. And it's possible that they were being used as ritual consumption because we found some buttery marks on some of these bird bone. Uh, the crane bone was found near a pit fill, so a bit of a ditch uh, deposit that also had redeposited early Bronze Age human remains. So basically, someone who was reusing this cave in the medieval, post medieval period. Uh, had found this human remain from the early Bronze Age and placed it on this collection of animal bones, which is actually the background of my uh, Zoom uh, background is the pit fill itself. So there's so much potential on what this could be. Is it witchcraft? Is it pagan rituals happening in the medieval period? Is it just someone who's very interested in uh, you know, remains and found them and, you know, just wanted to create his own little uh, deposit. Um, you know, it's incredible, honestly. Uh, but let's not spend too much time on Cows Cave 2. Let's move on to Cows Cave 1. Uh, so not as abundant in red deer remains as Cows Cave 2, but in comparison to Sculptor's Cave, not as many domestic remains. So was it as an was it also used for ritual, but maybe not as frequently? Um, Kazuki 1 had much more representation, I believe, from Felid and Canada remains, specifically when it comes to gnawing. So that's important because it shows you where activity is occurring. Because it, it's all well and good to have the remains of the animals themselves, but when you find evidence of them actually scavenging and eating other animals, that just shows you kind of where they were actually doing things, where they, their activity was taking place. And you can conceptualize that with the human activity that's also occurring. Um, so are they scavenging this food? Are they being fed? Again, not having that information on domestication, unfortunately, leaves us with more questions. but. It's really interesting to think of. And then finally, you have Laird Stables. So just a quick note that all of these um, contexts were unstratified at the time of recording, although later radiocarbon dating results show evidence for the Roman Age, uh, ro sorry, for Roman Iron Age activity. Uh, this is just a, a bit of a comparison between Laird Stables with other parts of Cows and Cave 2, just to kind of see where it fits. Um, so it made for an interesting comparative case, actually, because of it had more of a natural species uh, signature, uh, more of a natural baseline, if that makes sense, where there were a lot more uh, small mammal remains and bird remains. So when I first looked at it, it was easy to say, oh, this is probably more natural. These are more natural deposits rather than people bringing things in. However, as many cases, I was wrong. Um, looking into it further, um, we found paving stones and deposits of boar tusks, which are here on your right. And those imply a bit more ritual use. So it was likely ritual use, but on a much smaller scale than say Celtic Cave 2. Um, we also had the appearance of domestic mammals. So that kind of indicates that people are bringing these animals in. There aren't necessarily, you know, going in on their own, uh, especially if you saw how small some of these caves are. Um, so, Again, there's also canid and feeler remains, and the pitch on the top left is uh, canid verte vertebral bone, and on the bottom left is the single horse bone we found in large stables. So maybe there actually was a stable after all. 
So to wrap things up a bit, um, obviously there's a lot to talk about and I could easily do another, you know, 20, 25 minutes on just the caves themselves. Uh, and it's ultimately the story behind the caves is much more complex than we originally thought. The timeline of the caves is extended with additional reuse occurring at the medieval period. This is a very general uh, timeline I kind of put together of some of the key points. Uh, so in the Neolithic, you have the Red Deer remains. At the end of the Neolithic, beginning of the Bronze Age, you have the appearance of Great Auk. Uh, at the end of the Bronze Age, we see pig remains being used, including this pig mandible, which is on the bottom in the middle, that has um, a skinning marks. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. It's on the very bottom of the mandible, right underneath the molars. And it's very similar to the skin, skinning uh, butchery marks that we find on some of the human mandibles, which is very interesting to think about. And Iron Age, we see a, a bit more in terms of fish remains. Those spines are from Gurnard, which is a, a, a specific species of fish, which actually wouldn't necessarily be caught uh, on purpose. So it's, it was interesting to note how much Gurnard remains that were, were found in that cave. Uh, and then as we move into the med medieval, again, we find that crane, uh, tibia tarsus, which is on the bottom right, and also more felid remains, which is on the top right. Um, so kind of looking at it all together, we have a broader sense of connectedness and activity between caves. Some activities are saved for certain caves, remains of animals and, hu and humans were being left in certain caves or being taken out of certain caves. So you have this kind of in and out activity that I don't think we necessarily thought was happening at the start. Um, and then as we go later on into the medieval period, we have this idea of, is, <laughs> is, is it witchcraft? Is it something like that? Something very esoteric and maybe pagan happening? Because it's so late to have these kind of intricate uh, ritual remains, uh, which are, again, so different than what we were seeing in the prehistoric. Um, and we can likely gauge the type of activities based on species representation and the anthropogenic dichotomy present. But again, it's interesting to note the differences between the caves themselves, as well as the differences between time periods. So certain activities were being saved for certain caves, but also certain activities were clearly favored depending on what time period we were in. And another thing that really struck me in doing this research is the duality of cave use. And we are going to get into a bit more abstract, which is the parts of uh, ritual and funerary zooarchaeology that I love. <laughs> this is probably speaking from my training as an anthropologist uh, during my bachelor's. <laughs> but, you know, you have this duality of cave use. You have the natural aspects, the natural inhabitants of the caves and the human visitors who are coming and going and occasionally staying to do, you know, butchery or excarnation or depositing of their human ancestors. Um, and th this arguably influences the importance of the cave on a cultural level for these people as it represents a literal interface. You already have it as a symbolic interface between the living and the dead with the deposition of human remains. But now you also have this kind of added layer of, you know, the interface between the worlds of the natural world and the human world. Uh, so ultimately, you still have so many questions that um, remain, but they're also really illustrative of the complexities that lie in doing this kind of zooarchaeology uh, and doing this kind of archaeology in general. But this is why I really love this kind of zooarchaeology and why it's so fascinating to me. Um, so kind of just to end things, we're going to go back to step back and <laughs> look at zooarchaeology on its own again. So, you know, where do we go now? Um, obviously, I don't want to represent it as, you know, the ritual and funerary zooarchaeology is like the newest cutting edge zooarchaeology, which isn't true. This has all been happening at the same time as all 
all other forms of zooarchaeology. Um, you know, people are still working on food and subsistence, zooarchaeology and farm and domestication at the same time as people like me are working on ritual funerary archaeology. Instead, I kind of want to see it as more of a building of knowledge, maybe not sequentially, but more of just kind of broadening our understanding of how animals interact with humans throughout history and their importance in our lives. So I think as we broaden our conception of that kind of thing, um, I think we're also opening ourselves up and opening up to archaeology to exciting new avenues. And to be fair, this also includes technology as well as theory. So as we kind of open ourselves up to more abstract conceptions of zooarchaeology with work like social zooarchaeology, which I find really fascinating. There's people who are now doing work in kind of non-anthropocentric uh, zooarchaeologies, specifically looking at osteobiographies of animal bones themselves, but not really, you know, kind of focusing on human remains or human interactions. But, and also, you know, we have advances in technology to help with that. And I thought the best way to end this, uh, these slides is to use probably one of my most anticipated uh, approaches to archaeology, or not approaches. Uh, so Digital Bones, uh, they're on Twitter, and I will also put their website on the bottom. They are a free digital reference collection, and I'm so excited about this especially, you know, looking at the perspective from the pandemic. We've all been learning new ways to share information, to collaborate. And I've been basically dying for a digital reference collection at this scale. So I'm very excited about this project. Um, I think it, it will be such a good resource and will help us continue kind of making these collaborations, even as the pandemic kind of goes to a certain sense of normality, I think we'll still want to maintain a lot of these new interventions and new approaches to collaboration that we've kind of instilled in our everyday lives because of, you know, lockdown and things like that. And again, another thing I want to talk about real quick is, you know, zoo archaeology, as it opens itself up to new kind of approaches, I think we're also kind of having more complex conversations to have. Um, including anthropocentrism, including hard questions on cons conservation and applying zooarchaeology to current day conservation, and more specifically, colonialism and how even though we're talking about animal bones, there's still aspects of colonialism we have to kind of engage with in zooarchaeology. And basically, I want to say, where do we go now? Interdisciplinary collaboration is key. It is, um, you know, zoo archaeology is constantly in motion, just like the rest of archaeology. We're opening ourselves up to so many new avenues of thought and theory and practice. And I'm so excited to see what the future has for us next. Thank you and um, have the enjoy the rest of the event.